uh, are having uh, this hearing, this is an official hearing, open to the public. It's not a public hearing, but it's open to the public. Public can observe it and hear it. Um, we have been given just this, these few hours today is all we could get this week because of the limitations. And I'm not sure what they are. They're, they're technical. They're uh, either on bandwidth or um, actual pieces of equipment. I actually don't know, but we're unable to have every committee meet at the same time like we normally do. So that's the reason for that constraint. If you're all wondering why it was, we had to wait all week. Also, um, the um, COVID-19 um, emergency legislation that we were involved with, that, that involved uh, transportation um, was, was passed. We, if we want to, can look at that again. And that's why we're starting today to look at that and perhaps understand it better than we might have been able to um, in our rush to um, quickly convince ourselves to support it. And um, I know of one issue that, that has come up. Um, so we can talk about that. Uh, actually, I meant to have us all introduce ourselves because there might be people tuning into this, uh, members of the public who don't normally tune in, uh, or don't normally come to the state house. This is actually for them an advantage. Um, so uh, why don't we quickly do that? And I'm Kurt McCormick. Uh, I represent the um, city of Burlington and uh, I chair the committee. Uh, Barbara, why don't you go next and then um, let's go in the order that our pictures are maybe. So Barbara. Barbara Murphy, I serve Fairfax as vice chair of house transportation. And I am going to actually pass it to Tim because I think maybe our picture orders are all different. Oh. And I'll let him in. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Tim Corkin, and I represent Bennington District 2-1. Tim is the member of the committee. Okay, uh, Molly? Ooh. Molly, I believe you're muted. Okay. You did. Okay, yeah. I'm unmuted. Molly Burke, representing Brattleboro. Uh, Connie? Good morning, Connie Quimby. I live in Concord. I represent eight towns in the Northeast Kingdom. Brian? Good morning, I'm Brian Savage. Um, I uh, live in Swanton. I represent Swanton in Shell. Mary? I'm Mary Sullivan. I represent the South End Hill section of Burlington. Becca? I'm uh, Becca White and I represent the town of Hartford. Patty? Hi, I'm Patty McCoy. I represent the towns of Pulteney and Ira. Mike. I'm Mike McCarthy. I represent St. Albans. Lori, is, is um, Dave Potter online yet? He is not yet. We're working on it. Okay, there's one more member whose name is Dave Potter and he represents uh, Clarendon and West Rutland. Uh, and maybe another town around Western uh, Rutland County, uh, and he's going to be trying to tune in by telephone. Then we also have uh, our support staff with us today, and maybe they should introduce their, some, themselves also. Um, uh, Anthea. Hi, Anthea Dexter Cooper, Legislative Council. And Neil. Neil Schickner, Joint Fiscal Office. And Lori. I'm Lori Morse, um, Committee Assistant. And I guess Julie. Also, just so people aren't confused when they see these names. Julie? Oh, maybe she's not on. Hey, I was unmuting. Hi, I'm Julie Tucker. I'm Ledge Council Committee staff just providing support. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, so let's begin with um, Anthea telling <coughs> us about the uh, the COVID-19 emergency legislation, especially the things that, that you think um, need the most explanation. Sure thing. And I'm going to share my screen. So hopefully this still works. That show up for you guys? It does. And okay. does it show up for the public also? I believe it should. I think what is streaming on YouTube will be whoever's talking in the top screen in a little picture, and then the share screen filling most of the YouTube stream. 
Very good. It's real nice and clear on my screen. Yeah. Great. <clears throat> so what I'm actually showing is the house journal from, uh, I guess it would have been Wednesday, yesterday. Was that yesterday? The house journal, oh, today's Friday, sorry. The house journal from Wednesday. So this is what you, the house, um, agreed with the Senate's proposal of amendment to H-742. And there are three sections, sections 35, 36, and 37, that relate to what the Department of Motor Vehicles has already started to do. The reason why these sections were included in this legislation is because of a separation of powers issue. The General Assembly makes the laws and even in a state of emergency, the executive branch can't just go and change around laws that have already been enacted, your codified laws. So you'll see in every single section, there is at the beginning of subsection A, or in the case of section 36, we've got A, B, and C as our subsections, notwithstanding any provision of, and then there's a citation to something in Title 23. So there are policy initiatives and changes that the Department of Motor Vehicles has already undertaken going back to March 17th and March 20th. And this is just making it so that they have the authority from the General Assembly to continue doing what it is that they're doing. And you'll see that every sort of effective and continue in effect clause, which will be subsection B in section 35, subsection D and E in section 36, and subsection B in section 37, says that it is retroactive to either March 17th or March 20th, and it continues in effect for the length of the state of emergency related to COVID-19. So generally speaking, what these three sections are doing is making it, well, sections 35 and 36, section 37 is a little different, making it so that the Department of Motor Vehicles can continue to let people have permits, licenses, temporary plates, placards for individuals with disabilities, plates for individuals with disabilities, continue to be available to them while the Department of Motor Vehicles branches are closed because they've suspended in-person operations. Or allowing for, in the case of section 35 with the photographs for renewals, people mm -hmm. to continue to um, get new um, photo licenses, the learner's permit, the license to operate, the driver privilege card with a photograph that might be slightly older than a photograph that would be allowed under existing law. So that's the, the big picture. Um, I don't know- I interrupt if for a minute. I, I can't scroll this, I can't move it. Is that is that the way it's supposed to be? Oh. Yes, you are looking at my screen. It's just like as if I'm projecting in the committee room. All right, so you're in charge of scrolling. I am in charge of scrolling. Okay, so I was only, I was only able to see section 35 and the section 36A. Yes. Right. Same with all of us. Yep. All right. I was just didn't want to make sure that that I wasn't, you know, missing out on something. Okay. Sorry. Sure. Um, Representative McCormick, I don't know if you want me to do um, more detail than just that overarching big picture of section 35 and 36. I can certainly walk through it and then actually scroll through the language. No, well, let's 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 walk through it. Okay. So I will now scroll. Section 35, this is the photographs for renewal. So we're notwithstanding three subsections. These are the sections in current law that say in one instance that your photograph can be nine years or, old or newer. And that was a change you made last year in the miscellaneous motor vehicle bill. There are two places where it currently says the photograph um, needs to be eight years or newer. Under the Federal Real ID Act, which you'll see a citation to at the bottom of subsection A, where it says 6 CFR part 37, I wonder if I can highlight right there. The Federal Real ID Act says that photographs on licenses can be used provided that they're not more than 16 years old. From a practical standpoint, by saying that a photograph can be 16 years or newer for purposes of the continuation of the COVID-19 state of emergency, you're not going to get to 16 years unless the state of emergency continues for another eight years because the people who are up for renewals that would need to avail themselves of this 
are going to be very close to that eight or nine year mark already. So in essence, you're really just letting someone get a third four year term license learner's permit, driver privilege card, non-driver identification card with a photograph that was taken at most eight or nine years ago, because that's just the way that our renewal cycle works. Yep. This would let someone renew their license through the mail. And I believe, and this would be a question for the Department of Motor Vehicles, that the plan was to get that up online later on in the, the spring so that someone can get another license even though their photograph is too old. Yeah. So the 16 years was a little confusing, um, looking like we maybe are just saying everybody can keep the photos for 16 years on their licenses. Every, so everybody understand that? I, I guess they do. <laughs> okay. And where you're getting uh, the length of, the highlighting's not gonna work very well, where you're getting the length of how long it is that this is gonna remain in effect is it says that it will continue in effect starting on March 20th of 2020, continuing in effect until the termination of the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of COVID-19. So once that's over, you're going to need to get a new photograph taken if you're gonna renew your license after the state of emergency has been declared. As we're gonna to get to in section 36, someone could choose not to get a new license if they think that the state of emergency is gonna last 90 days or less, because there is an automatic extension that you are adding in in section 36. So if there are no questions, I can move on to section 36. Um, if there are questions, again, how would I know? I think people were going to raise their hands, which you would see in the participant sidebar. But I have to have that sidebar open. I think so. Okay. Alternatively, I don't know if Lori is monitoring monitoring this she could email you if she saw a hand raised oh, okay I, I i see two hands and um but laurie um mm -hmm. when i do the participants it comes right out in the middle of my screen blocking the view of other things in the middle can i move that to the side or if you click on manage participants again it'll go away i think yeah but i want to be able to call on people mm -hmm. so um, I can um, text you, whoever has their hand raised or. Uh, no, I'll, I'll just go back and forth. Okay, okay. It's uh, Patty and, yes. um, and then Barbara. Okay. So Patty, please. I just have a question because I know we had talked about using that remote thing for Tim Corcoran and I'm wondering if Tim has renewed his license or where he is in the process. Has he used this new system? Tim? I have not. I actually went down uh, to our physical location in Bennington and, and got it done because uh, we weren't up in, obviously, in, in session. So I had it done down here. So I did not utilize that new feature. Okay, thank you. Okay, Barbara. Um, I really was just going to say, could we just go through the three sections? Because this is what we voted. And I think if we just make note of our questions, we can um, get through this piece in one chunk. Yep. Okay. So should I move on to section 36? Yes. And, and when you go all the way through it before we have more questions. Okay, great. So section 36 are your extensions. They are divided up into three subsections and then you get your continue and effect language. The first one is saying that uh, specific things that have a current length of 10 days on the low end, 60 days on the long end, will actually remain in effect for 90 days from the date of issuance. And that's gonna be your international registration plan trip permits and temporary authorizations. That's for the commercial vehicle operations, temporary registration certificates and temporary number plates. So those um, documents, credentials will last for 90 days as opposed to 10 days or 60 days. Subsection B is telling the Department of Motor Vehicles, the commissioner, that notwithstanding anything in Title 23, the commissioner of motor vehicles may extend any existing permits that they issue, except for the international registration plan trip permits, which are addressed specifically in subsection A. The Department of Motor Vehicles has issued a number of press releases and other um, enforcement bulletins 
and they actually have a list of how they are extending uh, a number of different permits. And I believe they're not extending all of the permits. So this is giving the Department of Motor Vehicles through the commissioner's discretion, the authority to continue doing that. And then finally, subsection C is saying that all of the um, driver's licenses, learner's permits, privilege to operate, non-driver identification cards, registrations, those will last for an additional 90 days after expiration. Those are things that the Department of Motor Vehicles started doing on March 17th, 2020. You'll see that I didn't finish that sentence. The registration plates or placards for an individual with a disability, that was not something that the Department of Motor Vehicles had said they were going to do. They have seen this language. That was something that I picked up on um, and the Department of Motor Vehicles said it was just an oversight that that was something that they had intended to extend as well. So all of those will continue in effect for 90 days after expiration. So when we were talking about the photographs up in section 35, someone could choose not to get a renewed license. Maybe they hate their photograph. Maybe they've totally changed their appearance in the eight years since that picture was taken. They could choose to keep their license for 90 days. It would remain in effect. But then at the end of that time, they would need to, um, hopefully the state of emergency will be over, or they would need to avail themselves of the ability to get that renewed license with the older photograph. Then subsections D and E, that's just your retroactive language, either to March 17th or March 20th, and you're continuing effect for the length of the time that the state of emergency has been declared. So those are the DMV practices that have been implemented to make it so that they don't need to have their branches be open. Section 37 is a little different. In 23 VSA section 1283, we specify that the type one and type two school buses need to use that eight way, eight light system. And that's when the door opens, the stop sign comes out, the red lights flash. They, the statute says that that can only be used when school children are being loaded or unloaded and that it must be used when school children are being loaded or unloaded. The commissioner effective um, March 20th, 2020, said that she was giving authority for those lights to be used when food was being unloaded or loaded for school age children. And this is just making it so that the General Assembly, the branch of government that makes the laws, says that that is a permitted use for those red flashing lights on school buses. And that is the um, end of the three sections. All of them are effective on passage but they all have that retroactive language in them. So really we're going back and saying from March 17th or March 20th, continuing to the end of the state of emergency, these are the changes that have been made to Title 23 for purposes of the Department of Motor Vehicles continuing operations and the use of those school buses. Okay, questions for Anthea. Okay, I don't see any hands. Um, uh, Anthony, I have a question. Um, sure. These 90 day extensions of, of different things that have a, a, a cost to them uh, when you renew probably every one of these things as a, as a fee, um, are, is that, does the, is the state losing that money um, or does the, um, the, the driver, um, that, that 90 days, is, uh, is, do you pay that later? You do oh, not pay that later. And Neil is the person who's been in uh, okay. contact with the Department of Motor Vehicles, Director of Operations, Mike Smith, and can probably speak to this better than I can. I believe he's on. Yep. Neil? Neil yes. You hear me? Yes. Did you hear my question? Yes, I did. So how much uh, money is the state losing with these extensions? Well, um, right now, the latest estimate for uh, the transportation fund and the TIB fund in terms of FY20, the current fiscal year, is that uh, there'll be a deficit in the range of $34 million. Now, just in terms of these 
just in terms of registrations, driver's license, inspection stickers, and the international registration plan. I can tell you the last year in the fourth quarter, so you're talking about April, May, and June, uh, the total revenue collected there was uh, $27 million. So <clears throat> depending upon, that would be if 100% of the people take advantage of this and none of those fees are paid until the next fiscal year, then the loss would be $27 million. But again, the Tom Kovetz estimate for the FY20 deficit is more in a range of $34 million. Now, the loss is to the T fund, but not necessarily to the state because, <clears throat> okay, you're supposed to pay your license in, uh, in June, for example, and you wait and you pay it in July. Uh, the impact to the state is uh, the treasurer loses that, the value of that cash flow for 30 days or so. But the impact on the T fund is um, the T fund that takes the whole hit in FY20. One reason for that is DMV, their IT system is so antiquated that they're only going to be able to handle this uh, in the following manner. You, your license is due in June. You wait 30 days. You pay it in July. When it's renewed in July, you're going to be on a new system so that your renewal will be the following July. So you'll pay in July, but then you'll be on a new July, July system. So <clears throat> the effect of that is the T fund is short in FY20, your $74 for renewing your license or in, in FY20, you pay it in FY21, but that's not additional money in FY21 because under the old system, you would have paid the, paid the following June anyway. So there's a hit to the T fund, but really in terms of the state overall, it's just a matter of, of shifting money from one time period to another time period. And so it's the time value of the money. Okay, um, but I, I'm not sure I heard an answer to my question. Maybe I did, but um, I'm wondering what is the value? What is the loss of just this legislation here in front of us now, the 90 days, that time period? If people- Well, you know, we don't know. It could be- 15 months. It could be in a range of uh, 27 million, but it's likely to be much smaller than that. It could be as much as $27 million just for these yes. three months extension? Yes. But it's likely to be smaller than that because uh, some people are going to go online. If 75% exercise the option of, of delaying for 90 days, then you're talking about a, a revenue loss of around 20, $22.7 million. 27 times that percentage. Wow. Okay. Um, as much as 20, $27 million. All right, other, um, I think I saw Mike, some, his name appeared at the bottom. Mike, do you have your hand up? No. Actually, I'm not seeing. Nope. Okay, any, any other questions for Anthea or Neil on this legislation? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Anthea. No problem. Um, let me get rid of this thing. Uh, all right, so um, uh, S339, that's the miscellaneous motor vehicle bill. And if I didn't, I think I didn't finish telling everyone um, that Patty may have more information than I do on, you know, what how people are, are uh, viewing, anticipating the rest of this session. Um, 
you know, do we take the T-bill back in and, 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 and look at it again, more than look at it, you know, rewrite it um, in light of uh, obviously all these uh, lost revenues, but then also this federal money. Um, but I don't know. And, I, and um, when I've inquired about that, the answer has been, let's deal with this emergency legislation first and then we'll, we'll deal with those things. So I don't know, Patty, can you tell us any more than, than that? Patty, please. Yep, can everybody hear me? Yep. I'm unmuted, okay. Uh, the only thing I know is um, appropriate, appropriations doesn't know. They know that they're looking at a $260 million deficit for FY20. And that's the combination of all, you know, our transportation funds, our general fund, the capital, everything and combined. <clears throat> so they don't even know about the budget coming forward for FY21. They're really looking to see if they should just keep the budget that they had been working on, knowing that come July, August, September, that whole thing will have to be re reworked. Um, they really don't know. I mean, nobody knows. So um, my, I don't know what, uh, I have not, we just passed our T bill out. So I don't know what the Senate is planning on doing with that. I mean, also, I can't answer that. I'm, I'm not quite sure what monies, if any, are in the, this DMV bill in front of us. The only thing I do know that um, the bills that were either on the wall or in the calendar, if there was any money attached to any of those bills, Mitzi is very hesitant about even bringing them forward because of the uncertainty of knowing what we're dealing with. Yep. That's all I got. So it is likely to pass the Senate, it's uh, passed second reading, it's on uh, the, their calendar for third reading. Um, I believe there's a, there's a floor amendment that um, is almost housekeeping, so I don't think that's gonna be an issue um, on that bill in the Senate. So I think we are gonna have that bill and um, Pat, Patty, yes? One more thing, I know that, you know, the must pass bills must pass the transportation bill, the capital bill, you know, the um, revenue bill and the, the big bill, the general fund bill, those absolutely have to pass. So we should be looking at the T bill. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I just heard a telephone ring. Um, okay, so that's why I thought we should work on, you know, what we just did, that bill, and then also um, the DMV bill. Um, this is Commissioner Manoli. I, uh, Mike Smith's not with me right now. He had to step out. Okay, so we have you by phone. Um, that was, yeah, that was the connection I was provided. Okay. Um, all right. Well, let's let's um, start with you then, uh, Commissioner. Uh, tell us about the um, the uh, Senate uh, DNEVO S 339. We've had a, a, the beginning of a walkthrough. I think we only reached about section seven or eight of the 32 sections I think it has. So um, maybe with this uh, swarm amount of time we got, maybe you could, um, you've got a half hour in, in along with Mike when he comes on. So if you can, um, Tell us what, uh, highlight the important parts uh, for you. Um, so, um, Representative Barbara? I just was gonna throw out there, Tim and I had that question that is for the agency. So um, if at the appropriate point, we could get that resolved of what we've already covered, that'd be great. Okay, yeah, so um, don't forget that. And uh, Wanda, you have to leave at uh, 12 o'clock also, right? Um, and, and I can, I can, yes, I can come back. Um, if the committee, I'm just going to offer this. I, because we did watch the live, um, uh, uh, the live conversation that was going on through zoom, Mike and I did, we've been making some notes as Anthea walked through, um, S339 as proposed to the house. If you would like to continue with that, 
and then we could comment after we are more than willing to accommodate. Well, if not, that makes more sense for the committee. Well, since we have you, why don't you comment on what, what has been covered by Anthea and then also take the questions from Barbara and Tim? Because that, those questions are in that uh, a section that, we've, that we have uh, had the walkthrough on. Um, okay. Sure. Okay. Sure. Since you watched it, so I'm, I, and you've you've all, you've gone through section eight, is that correct? Um, where exactly did we did we stop, Anthea? Okay. Anthea, what uh, what was the last section that we covered? Section eight. Yep. Okay. So, I, and we went through eight. We went through eight. Okay. I was going to start at section nine when we picked back up. Yep. Okay, Wanda. Sure. Okay. So you you're so no. do you want me to I mean I don't um I I would say that um the you know the walkthrough that has uh, occurred so far there's really um there's no comments um I think really we're open do you have any questions on those I'm open to do you have any questions on those sections Okay uh Barbara and Tim um Wanda are Thank you. Our, our question was on section six with changing um, the model year for exhibition vehicles and just a concern that with um, setting it as 50 year olds or more, we put it in place where a vehicle as as Tim was saying could be um, hot rod. Um, just that, that these vehicles are going to be exempt from inspection and whether we want to open that up to uh, an 80 year expanse. Um, I, I don't feel comfortable um, saying that it makes sense to open it up to an 80 year. Um, the purpose of the language, we had originally proposed uh, 1970 um, to the Senate um, there were some changes with the Senate working with Anthea. Um, this is minimal. Um, the the 50 year model is uh, really falling under the sort say the um, as antique cars because they're exhibition vehicles. Um, I like I said I, with everything going on, I have we have not put any thought into an 80 year. Um, it's, you know, I don't think the, the 50 year, the way I understand, um, Anthea, uh, modified this language, um, is that the 50 year is a rolling and the way she's written it, which makes sense, um, doesn't mean that we have to revisit it every year. We had proposed 1970, the way it's written, um, it's to, you know, so we don't have to re revisit and it's, it's really a minimal use. It's a low number of cars in the inventory. I don't have those numbers in front of me. Um, just to follow up, Kurt, if I may, I, I didn't mean to confuse things with the 80 year. It's just going currently it would be 80 years because it's 1940. Um, that's just why I was triggering on that number. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I don't have any, I don't have, do you have a specific question? Um, I guess I'm, I'm, you know, I, I feel that it was pretty simple language. We weren't asking for a lot. We're not trying to change the whole inspection program. We're just trying to be consistent with other um, exceptions in, in statute and, uh, and we propose this. Yep. I, I will make one last comment and then I'll give Tim the moment. I just, my concern goes, ties back to the prior section in section five, which we did not too many years past, that we permit people to use these vehicles on the streets at least once a week or incidental use. And I think that when we're exempting vehicles from inspection, we have to be a little careful Okay. I understand your, your point. 
Uh, Tim? Uh, no, I think Barbara covered it well. I mean, I mean, I guess I mean, there's not much to add. I guess my, my two cents is when we originally passed this uh, uh, language, like I said, I forget the time frame, but maybe three, four or five years ago, uh, we, we put 1940 in there for a specific reason, because if we went higher with it, you got allowed more of the muscle cars and, and our uh, comfort level wasn't there exempting them. Uh, but if you did 1940 and earlier, you know, they were the Model Ts, they weren't souped up cars. So, uh, I mean, that was the thought process then. And uh, I mean, I guess, you know, like I said, Barbara covered it well. I mean, it, it, apparently the AMP doesn't really have that heartburn because it's not gonna add too many more vehicles, but, uh, but that was our thought process uh, at that time. Okay. Wanda, Thank you for sharing that. Wanda or Anthea, um, uh, the, this is there any other what do we say in law or at least by by rule um what does occasional use mean is that defined in other words can somebody have one of these old cars not have to get it inspected and drive it uh, ten thousand miles a year um representative mccormick i'm pulling up the language um and this is in existing law it's just being rearranged because we're sort of formatting differently but saying a vehicle, and I'm on page 10 at line nine, a vehicle that is registered as an exhibition vehicle may be used for the occasional transportation of passengers or property. As used in the subsection, occasional means not more than one day per week. Okay. All right, I, um, I guess we haven't, has there been any problem with that that you know of Wanda? Any complaints of by a neighbor of someone who uses their antique car? Uh, a lot more than that? No. Okay. 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 Um, uh, anything else for Wanda? Wanda, is there anything else you want to tell us about this bill now? And you, st you still have 15 minutes. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think it's really, um, uh, Chair McCormick, I think it would be really helpful to, um, have Anthea continue walking through and then, um, you know, answer any of your, um, I mean, Mike and I could check back in at one or one thirty and answer more questions if you want. Um, I think what I would say to the committee in, in the times that we're faced with right now, we really went through this bill. And as you know, Anthea walked you through it this morning and said um, that to continue our operations during this time, um, there were some sections that we proposed we would, we're asking the committee to absolutely support. And I, that has been where our, our focus has, has been. And she, as I said, she walked that through. So we're here to um, answer any questions. I'm here to try to accommodate your schedule. I'm just, I'm, you know, how would you like to proceed? Okay. Would well, you like that? Well, there'll be no 130 for us today. At 125, we are off, and that's it. Okay. Uh, and I don't even know when we can get more time. We, there will be more time, but I don't even know when that is yet. So, you know, stand okay. by for that. Let, let me ask you this. Can you talk to us about H, uh, S339 that... Um, do you support everything in it now? Do you guys support? Is there anything in it that you that you don't support? Um, and uh, maybe if you quickly tell us, you know, which things came from you guys, which things came from that committee. Um, um, I, I don't. I mean, I don't think you want me to go through. Six, I'm. I. I would like to say that um, moving forward, right now, the items that Anthea. Um, presented to you on photographs for renewals, um, the extension uh, language that was laid out, um, and the use of the eight light systems on school buses. And I may be working from the wrong list. I apologize. There's so many pieces of paper. Um, the, this, this, this COVID. I, I guess for us at this point, the must-haves that we uh, provided to your legislative council are really the critical items we need. Um, we put a miscellaneous bill together that is in front of you. Um, we focus always on cleaning up language. 
um, and identifying things that we need to modify as we go through the year. That's the bill that is presented um, in the actual Senate S-339. There's nothing in that bill um, that we oppose as presented to you. Um, I don't know if you want me to, I'm, I guess I'm hesitant about going through the whole bill and telling yeah. you where each okay. section came from. Okay, I've got uh, Barbara and then Michelle, please. And then Molly. I, I don't need to ask my question. Let's skip to uh, Michelle, please. Okay, Michelle. So um, there is one section I just want to uh, bring to your attention. Um, and I'm sorry, I was just trying to find the section number, but Anthea probably can roll it off the tip of her tongue. Um, it's the section on um, safety devices. And um, sorry, my screen has gone back. Um, safety Are you devices. talking about section 28, Michelle? Thank you. Thank you. Which is the use of lighted paddle signaling devices? That's the one. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, and so now, now, of course, I can't get back to my other screen, which <laughs> I was able to do just a minute ago. Um, at any rate, um, what uh, Wayne Simmons wanted me to share with the committee was that we had not supported this section um, as this was developed by the Senate Transportation Committee. Um, right now, we have um, a committee that meets twice a month to talk about safety measures and use of safety devices and practices. And um, so we already have a system and a process in place to undertake safety evaluations. Um, there was concern that uh, widespread use of this type of device um, might um, create a situation where the public becomes desensitized to the use of the device. And we would like to move forward um, testing the use of these devices in higher speed locations where we feel as though they'll provide the highest benefit. Um, but just our concern that if we start using them everywhere, people won't pay attention to them and also have some concerns over if we were to use them everywhere, uh, industry's ability to um, be able to procure uh, an adequate amount and what the cost would be to um, have these in use on a widespread basis. So I think those were the key points um, that Wayne uh, Simmons shared with me. Okay, can someone explain um, what these paddles are? I'm, I just, I have nothing I'm envisioning is it what it is and why it's called a paddle. So it, can you think about when you are, um, you know, called to stop um, for a, a traffic, um, um, you know, uh, incident where there might be paving or something going on where there's a, a flagger in the road and they've got a, a signpost in their hand yep. and they turn it from stop to go slow, stop and slow. And so basically that pa that's what's called the paddle. Oh, okay. That sign that they're holding. And yeah. what this would do would have the sort of edging around the, um, the stop part of the sign be lighted so that it would become more prominent for a person who's approaching this, um, this stop sign. Got it, thank you. I, I suppose I was the only one who didn't know that what a paddle was. Okay. <laughs> um, other questions for Michelle? And I think I had um, uh, Molly, I think, had her hand up before. Molly, yes? Yes. Yes. Uh, you always have to look for the unmute. I, I don't know whether this is a, a place to ask because it may be that it just doesn't pass the Senate, but I was going to ask the commissioner. Um, if they had any um, opinion on the Rogers Amendment that would basically do away with OBD inspection? Um, uh, so I um, was quite surprised when I read that amendment in the calendar, and um, I do not know what action the Senate is going to take on that. We have not testified 
on that. We were not reached out. Um, Michelle and I um, worked uh, after we saw the um, the calendar and and the amendment in it. We did reach out to A&R. Michelle took the lead for me on this. And we don't support the language. Okay. And A&R does not support the language. Michelle, do you want to add to that? Sorry, lost my screen again. Um, yeah, the, <laughs> they um, that you've stated the entirety of it. Um, a and R was um, very surprised to see the language as well, and and was not supportive. Great, thank you. Well, he's not a member of the transportation committee. Just in terms of being, you know, surprised that he's offering it. Um, okay. Um, anything else that you want to tell us? For now, about three thirty. I guess I guess you did, um, uh, Rhonda. Yeah, I, I guess what I'd like to say to to the um, committee, you know, I mean, we all know these are very difficult times, and I just want the committee to know that you know my organization and my leaders, we have worked really diligently to put a continuity plan together to continue delivering services. Um, to Vermonters in alternative ways, um, and and it is working every day. Um, our environment changes, and um, you know, but we have we have been successful. Um, I know that you had some discussions, you know, this morning um, with Neil regarding um, the the timing on when revenues will be coming in. And on the 90-day registration, there is going to be a period that, you know, people who choose, and I want to emphasize that, to utilize the 90-day, um, there will be a shift in, in the revenue, and there will be some lost revenue. Um, on, the, um, on licenses, we won't lose revenue because they're all renewals. They just may come later in the year. What I want to share with you is that people are still mailing in their registrations. Um, we are at our normal production on what we receive by mail with registrations. It hasn't gone up. So we're tracking this. We're evaluating it. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm honored to say that uh, we're, we're still providing the services to Vermonters. We have, since the governor's directive, we have um, found alternative ways because of our new licensing system to get individuals to use their photographs, to get people to send us their photographs. Um, and we do a, a verification so we can get them their license, especially people who have moved from out of state to Vermont. Um, you know, I mean, every day we, we're, we're being asked to see if there's a creative way we can deliver a service. Um, today we're working with Beta on accepting um, electronic uh, signatures. Um, and, you know, we're moving forward on it. We, we say, you know, for titling and for the banks, which is something that we haven't been able to do in the past and you know every scenario is a little bit different and we find a solution and i just want to you know and it's uh, quite an honor to be working with the group of individuals that are here as we continue to support vermonters and the businesses yes uh tim hi wanda tim corcoran uh quick question you know i don't know how this you know session is going to unfold and what bills may or may not move forward. Uh, I mean, I know that you presented this bill and you probably like a majority of it, but what sections in your opinion are a must pass for this year? And what ones, you know, maybe if we don't got time and, you know, uh, if we get a certain direction from uh, leadership that we could maybe push off to next year. So I already um, provided Anthea the must pass. Um, we're asking for the uh, school bus language, and I apologize, I don't have the sections in front of me, um, but this is the, the, uh, the old language that we, it's to modify the language to support plug-in electrical school buses and their colors, um, because, 
the uh, so we were asking for that. We think that's really important. Um, section 17 through 19 um, is language on our commercial vehicle operations new system, and it allows us to do electronic communication um, and some other initiatives. That is a we are really saying that's a must have because. Um, we have tentatively designed the system um, in anticipation we'd get support for this. And if we're not allowed to take those actions in Section 17 through 19, then while we have a new modern system, we're going to have to implement a very antiquated process. And then, um, and also Sections 20 and 21, um, which is in regards to the credits and refunds, for the um, overages that were allowed to apply them in these accounts um, to their other accounts and not automatically refund. Of course, all of these refunds will be available upon request, um, but the, the training on the system has gone out to industry. They've been really involved with us um, in designing it and, and we've done usability training with them. And it is really going to make a difference for their businesses. So they're going to be able to see you overpaid in this account. It's sitting here applied to your next payment. Um, and they can say, no, I want that money back and we'll refund it. But otherwise, they'll just leave that as a credit and the next month pay, you know, what's due minus, minus that credit. And so those are um, the must-haves. In our opinion, okay. The thank you very stuff, much. Yep. And one reason you say that is, or probably probably the reason you say that is that without it, we'll we'll collect fewer revenues. No, we won't collect fewer revenues. We will have a new modern system that allows the businesses to electronically. Uh, do their filings and track their their systems, and without this um, language, we're going to have to continue with paper and um, communicate through paper, not with electric means, and and do all refunds when they could choose to have um, when they do an overpayment, have it go to their next account in their payment. I, I guess so. It, the, the, these revenues will continue. These are our taxes. There's, yep. I guess, okay. So I, I guess I didn't fully understand the statement, Representative McCormick. No, I, I guess it was a question. Do we um, stand to lose um, more or less money um, without those changes? And you're saying no. But while we're on, right. that, on that same question, on the COVID-19, I'm really glad that you were tuned in when, when Neil told us about that, the COVID-19 um, DMV language. Um, he said it's possible we could, we, could, we could lose as much as, not this is not his estimate, but we could lose as much as $27 million just from those 90 day um, expiration uh, extensions or suspensions. Um, have you, guys um, looked it over. You said a lot of people are doing it anyway, uh, registering anyway, which is really good. What, um, do you have an estimate about how many, how much money we, we will lose? So um, Representative McCormick, the, what, what I understand is, um, I guess I wouldn't call it a loss. I call it a shift um, from, from the anticipated revenue we were going to collect in this quarter to the revenue to that shifting to the next quarter with the 90 day extensions. There is a, um, and Mike just joined me, we are with the 90 day extensions on um, registration renewals that people are going to choose um, in some cases to, to um, take their, we will be changing, um, you know, if the registration was due in May, it's now due in July. So in theory, there's some loss there, Mike, but we're still going to get that renewal. They're really getting a renewal um, at the 
same price for 14 months instead of 12 months. Correct. So, uh, hi, this is Mike Smith. Nice to talk to you. Oh, <laughs> it's weird. Or something. He waves <laughs> to you, everyone. <laughs> oh, is he, are you guys together? So he's coming. Yeah, I'm actually, we are now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so, and and Commissioner said it said it perfectly. It's really a shift. Um, you know, there are those two months that uh, could potentially, I guess, be be free, if you would, to a 14 month. But you know, based on the stats that we're seeing and what I'm hearing from staff, the renewals are still coming in. So I don't think that you're going to see that much of a shift. But there's no way to really do an estimate because. I, I don't know who's going to renew and who's not. And in order to do the estimate, you'd have to have somewhat of an idea, and I don't. So I think, you know, that's really um, – we're still going to collect that um, the, that registration, as, as Neil said, and I, I believe Representative Cochran also stated. Um, it's just going to – it's going to come later, and that's the, the shift. And it, it, it may come later. But really what we're seeing now is people are still renewing because they're still mailing them in. So yeah. it, it, it may not show. And I think that's important, too, um, to the committee members. We're still doing production. We're still sending out all of those necessary documents. We're still issuing, um, you know, license renewals, uh, registration renewals, boat renewals. Mm -hmm. All of those, that that, that work is, is continuing. Um, we're not providing in-person service. And um, that was the biggest change. And there's some stuff that's not a priority to process right now. Um, we've been focused on supporting our dealers, our, our stations, and the consumers because they, they want their license. They want a legitimate license. Um, they want their vehicle registered. Even though, you know, the um, law enforcement is at a tier two, which means I think all of you know they're they're not doing unnecessary stops during this time. Um, people are still going to their stations. They're still getting their vehicles repaired. Um, they're they're not choosing to drive un drive un unsafe uh, vehicles. Um, you know, and so and and the other thing that I just want to say to you on the. Um, the license renewal and the photo language, what we've implemented and what you're supporting in this is that we have state law that says you have to come into DMV to renew your license in person every nine years, because or eight years, but your photo's valid for nine years. You're really extending the validity of that photo to 13 years, so Vermonters can just mail in their renewal and they don't have to come in the office. But their renewal still stays in line with their renewal date. Right. It's just to the photo. Um, and we are doing the soft launch um, for online license renewals um, starting uh, March 31st, which is next week. Representative Corcoran, we had hoped you were going to be um, <laughs> our, our the, the tester. Um, but I'm glad you got to go to our Bennington office. Um, if any of you have a renewal coming up, reach out to me, and we'd love you to be one of the uh, first to try this uh, new system. Okay, so I, uh, I'm sorry. I, there's still something I think I'm not quite understanding. If have in, in any case, in, in any of the um, things that we are providing an exemption for, and I'm talking still the, the COVID-19 legislation, not 339. Um, aren't people essentially getting a 15-month registration or whatever it is we're talking about versus a 12-month? And what, what wouldn't that represent a loss in revenues? Um, so the answer would be yes, if they choose to do that. What we're seeing for data right now is people are not choosing to do that. They're mailing a renewal notice in. So those people that mailed it in are, are paying for their 12-month registration and getting 12 months. I am sure there are some people that are saying, cool, I can save a few bucks by extending this down the road a little. You know, but again, our stats are not, are not, are not showing a whole lot of that happening. So they are getting, a, and for the ones who choose, they will be getting a 15-month 
registration for the price of a 12 month. Right. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. we don't have an estimate. Um, you know, we really won't know what that looks like. And I don't even know how we could pull that data right. until, you know, we are, are, are through this. Okay. Okay, I want to go to Patty because I think she's right on this point. And I think I've got Barbara and Molly. Uh, so Patty. Wait, wait, Patty, you, you're, you're still, you're muted. Patty, you're muted. Okay, I'm done. Okay, go. Um, so Commissioner Minoli, um, town clerks register uh, renewals of um, registrations and they can go back two months. But when the, when the registration is renewed two months back, they still only get their 12 months worth. So really we're taught, we should be only talking about an, a limited number of people who actually wait for that third month, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So it's not as much of a loss as we think it might be because currently they can go back two months, right? Correct. Okay. Okay, Barbara, I think you had a hand up earlier. I did, and I just was fearful we were gonna lose um, Wanda and now Mike who's joined. And so I wanted to make sure that while they were still on and with Michelle and Costa that we thanked these people and asked them to pass on our thanks to everyone at the agency for, for what people have done, trying to keep, keep the lights on, keep things moving, really take care of Vermonters and, and the needs that allow them to stay legit as vehicle owners and all of the parts that go with that. So please, thank you. So thank thank you very much for saying that. Commissioner is like tearing up right now, so she's not able to speak, but I'm covering it for her. Thank you. There's not many people that say thank you to us and uh, we greatly appreciate that. And I will take a lot of pride in passing that on to the staff. Thank Good. you. Okay. We're familiar with that problem. Molly. And, and in that spirit, I wanted to thank you. Uh, and you were talking about creative ways of helping people in the way that you helped so quickly. The person that I wrote to you about who was having trouble getting the Vermont license and really, really appreciated it. It was very, very impressive how quickly- You're, you're, you're more than welcome. And I gotta tell you that, you know, <clears throat> the commissioner tells me to get outside the box every once in a while. I was not only outside the box, I was in a different box. Yeah, well, <laughs> It was, it was so great. And, you know, for somebody who just moved to Vermont to see state government move so nimbly and so quickly, uh, it was just like, I felt so proud. <laughs> so thank you. Well, thank you. Um, you know, and, and I, you know, and I like to share our successes with everyone. The investment that you um, allowed us to make in, in changing how we issue credentials is why we were able to do that. And 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 Mike having to get in another box, but we have fun with that, you guys. <laughs> so thank you. Okay, let's go to the federal stimulus package now. And um, obviously, let's try to limit our conversation to transportation because <laughs> uh, it's an enormous bill. Yeah. So Michelle. Um, so, um, Chair McCormick, I'm going to let Costa um, walk through the details on this. Um, he is our key point person working with the staff of our congressional delegation, uh, and he has the up-to-date details. And if the committee has the time, um, I have a few more um, updates in terms of what the balance of the agency outside of DMV is working on these days that I can share with you. That, that would be good, yes. And it just occurred to me, um, Neil, should we start with you for an overview? Well, it depends on what cost is working off of. I have uh, the spreadsheet from Lee Hay's office. Is that what you all have? I think we have the same thing. Costa? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, and I hope everyone is doing well through this crisis. I think I have a little more detail than what's on the spreadsheet that's been circulated, but that's up to the committee uh, in terms of how much information you want. So, Costa, let's have you do that, and Neil, please, um, you know, um, 
participate, um, raise your hand if you uh, wanted to elaborate or have a question. I don't even see Neil though. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. Okay. Gotcha. Sorry. Okay. Okay. So, okay. Pastor, please. Okay. Great. Um, so, before I get into discussing the contents of the latest stimulus bill, I want to quickly explain that uh, stimulus this time around is not a single piece of legislation, but a number of different pieces of legislation uh, that have been signed at different times. So the first stimulus bill was related to public health, and that was completed a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the second stimulus bill was to supplement unemployment insurance funds, and that too was signed a couple of weeks ago. Um, the third stimulus bill, which is the one I'm going to talk about uh, right now, uh, was completed a couple days ago, and it is not an infrastructure stimulus. The focus of the stimulus bill was on individuals, businesses, and government operations, not the infrastructure side of the equation. We are expecting that at some point in the next few weeks, a fourth bill that will deal specifically with infrastructure, broadly transportation and other types, but that has not started yet. So, as I mentioned, the, the third uh, stimulus bill uh, was completed a couple of days ago, and it's still in the process of being interpreted by federal agencies. So, the parts that deal with transportation uh, are very specific in that the funding is to be used to prevent, prepare for, and respond to the coronavirus. So, these are not general purpose funds. They're linked specifically uh, to COVID-19 uh, efforts. So there's four of them, and I'll go through them quickly one by one. The first one is $56 million available nationwide uh, for the Essential Air Service Program. That's the program uh, that, that helps pay the operating costs for flights to Boston out of the Rutland Airport. Uh, that $56 million, we don't know at this point how that's going to be divvied up. Uh, but to give you an idea of what kind of money we're talking about here, the typical annual appropriation for the Essential Air Service Program uh, is over $100 million. So this is close to half. And again, the idea being to support operations um, and other factors related to the coronavirus. The second um, program is a $10 billion grants for aid for airports program uh, that are, that's going to airports most of this funding is going to commercial service airports uh, that, that, that's based on the number of emplanements and debt service. Did you say uh, 10 billion? International... Did you say 10 billion? I'm sorry? Did you say 10 million or billion? billion nationwide, correct. Billion. Billion, that's yeah. right, with a B. Yep. And, and this is not to be confused with the business support programs for airlines. This is for airports. Yep. Now, and we're still under the now, heading of COVID-19 efforts, right? Correct. Everything I'm going to talk about today has to be related to COVID-19 efforts. That's right, because the infrastructure so, is going to come later. Okay. Yeah. So the... Uh, so Burlington International Airport is anticipated to get a, some of these funds. Again, we do not know until the Federal Aviation Administration computes uh, what their allotment's going to be. But as a commercial service airport, they're eligible for these funds. Out of the $10 billion, $100 million is to be used for general aviation airports, uh, of which our state-owned airports are eligible under this program. So there's $100 million set aside of the $10 billion pot for that purpose. Uh, and again, we do not know uh, exactly how much we're going to get uh, for, for general aviation airports. What we were told by our congressional delegation staff is that Vermont is anticipated to receive about $9.6 million total from the uh, $10 billion grant for aid for airports. It, we don't know at this point how much of that is going to the Burlington International Airport and how much uh, is for the general service airports that we own. So again, we're, we're waiting for guidance on the FAA on that one. 
The third program is grants for Amtrak. And here there's nationwide $1 billion available to continue supporting uh, COVID-related efforts for Amtrak. Out of that $1 billion, $239 million of it is set aside uh, for state-supported services like the Ethan Allen and the Vermonter. These are state-supported service uh, trains, and they are eligible under the $239 million out of that $1 billion. Again, we do not know how the federal agency will divvy up uh, the funding as there's no guidance in the legislative text itself. What, what was that figure but, that for the state supported Amtrak? Uh, $239 million available nationwide for state supported services out of a total pot of $1 billion okay. for Amtrak. Okay. Okay, and uh, the final provision relates to public transportation, and this is nationwide a $25 billion um, series of grants, again, to prepare uh, for and, and prevent and respond to the, uh, the coronavirus. Uh, our congressional delegation staff has informed us that their calculations related to Vermont's uh, portion is to be about $20 million, and that will be divvied up $7.4 million for the urbanized area, $12.3 million for the rural programs, and $371,000 for something new that we haven't seen before titled Growing States Transit Program. Uh, no details on that one yet. And we do not have at this point details from the Federal Transit Administration on how uh, they're going to interpret the legislative language related to what's eligible and what's not eligible under the transit program. So the, I think the point here is that a lot of this is in flux in terms of how federal agencies will interpret uh, the legislative text to divvy up the money and what the eligible categories of spending are gonna be. But the one thing that's clear is that these are all related to COVID-19 uh, and not general purpose funding. Okay, um, you said of the 20 million for transit, 7.4 7. was urban and what was the balance for rural? 12.3 for rural. Okay, 12.3 million. Correct. All right. And can you explain what, and must be defined, what is COVID related? Like I take it you couldn't buy a bus with it. Is it to just operating and make up for, for all the losses of, of all these operations or from the airports on down? So that is not clear at this point. Uh, the language is very broad in the uh, in the legislation, and that's why it's going to be important to wait a, to wait a few days for federal agencies to clarify how they're interpreting this language. Okay. All right, so I don't really know what exactly we can use the money for, what we could not. Correct. Okay. Right, um, Costa, um, this is great having this in front of us, but you, you realize that we are unable to scroll. Only you can scroll. That's me. Oh, Neil, yeah, okay. So did you, you realize that, right? Uh, yeah. We are unable to move this. So is this isn't the whole thing, is it? This is right now, yeah. These oh, are the okay. only transportation related items. Okay. I just can't even see the the Amtrak on this list. No, I don't either. No, I don't. The reason why you're not seeing the Amtrak on that list is that it's not an apportionment the way these other programs are. Right. Uh, the right. List of you is dollars we know for certain are coming to Vermont. Um, with with the Amtrak funding, there has to be calculations that are based on the services, not state boundaries. Right. Okay. All Question right. on the public transit. Yes. Um, my take on this is this is in, in <clears throat> helping to cover 
the operating costs. That's what it seems to be. And it's not really infrastructure, but um, for Costa, the question would be to the extent that we, we have this money that we can pump into the public transit agencies, does that free up some, some of the T fund money or, or the federal funds that have been flexed over to them for other, other public transit uses? I can answer that. Okay. Um, Michelle Boomhauer here. Um, so once we receive the guidance, um, we are gonna take a look at that and all the sort of alternative ways we could potentially deploy funds. Um, we are obviously very sensitive to the fact that we wanna find every way we can to reduce T fund utilization. And so we're gonna be doing a complete analysis, Neil, as you've, as you've suggested. Michelle, any idea of when you will have that guidance? Uh, I'm going to defer to Costa. Uh, now that the bill has been finalized, it shouldn't take very long. I would imagine in the next four to five days, we'll be, you know, we're going to start hearing from federal agencies on um, how they're interpreting the, the COVID, you know, prevention preparation language and response language. Uh -huh. When you get that Costa, would you could you pass it on? Yeah, of course. Thanks. All right. Well, uh, other questions for Costa, Neil, or Michelle on this? You got to take down the screen. Yeah. Could you take down the screen so we can see each other? Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. yeah uh, Kurt, Kurt. Tim and then Patty. Patty first. Well, um, well, Tim, yeah, okay, yes. Tim, <laughs> Tim did you have a, another question? Oh, no, I thought I was going to let Patty go. Uh, okay, no, yeah. the, obviously, the, the numbers that we're talking about public transit are, it sounds like a big influx to our current uh, budget. And I was just wondering, do we even have the means to expend, you know, $12 million of it solely limited towards, uh, you know, services? And if we can't buy buses, do we have... Do we do we have that capability to utilize that? And if we don't utilize that, do we are we in jeopardy of losing those funds? So we don't know that yet, and that'll be part of the guidance we'll be looking at. Um, you know, we have uh, public transit agencies who have staff that are um, at this point, in some cases, unemployed, um, laid off, um, various states of um, you know status based on the, the COVID situation. So we're gonna need to really take a look holistically. We also need to understand what the duration of these funds are because um, it may be that um, while the services are able to restart um, at some point in the coming months, um, the, it may be that the fair revenue will not pick up again for some time to come because ridership may be down for a long, longer period of time as people continue to have concerns about uh, congregating closely, et cetera. So there's, there's a lot um, we need to understand about the guidance and, um, and what we're gonna be faced with in terms of deployment of the resources. Yeah. Yeah, we look forward to that, hearing what that guidance is. <laughs> Um, other questions? Yeah, Patty. Uh, just, I just had a question about uh, Costa's um, spreadsheet. Is that available on our committee webpage? Uh, representative, the spreadsheet belongs to Neil. Uh, I think I have a copy of it laying around if uh, you want me to forward it uh, to Lori, but um, I think Neil's already got it. I emailed it to all committee members a couple of days ago. Okay, thank you. If you haven't received it, it's probably because I sent it to your ledge email. Or I've been on the teleconferences for the last yep. four days. I haven't even looked at my email. Yep. No, you should have it all. Okay, thank you. Okay. NCSL wrote up a similar um, table. Um, 
Okay, uh, anything else for these guys on, on the federal uh, stimulus packages? While we have Costa, I think maybe he should talk about the next federal bill, which they see coming down the road. An infrastructure one he referred to? Yes. Yeah. Costa, before you, that's a good idea, but before you start, um, uh, Laurie, um, I assume we don't need to be identifying ourselves or the, or the uh, non-committee members, witnesses, like they normally do because with the Zoom, we can see and uh, and the names are on the pictures. So is is this all going well as far as the record is concerned? Um, I have not been told um, to anything, anything about that, but I do see everybody's name with the exception of this last phone number that just came in. Mm, okay. Um, and Anthea, you think we're okay as far as that's concerned, right? Anthea? Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Yeah. Um, I am not sure um, what is being preserved for purposes of, you know, how Lori normally takes a recording and then that's saved. And with a recording, you <clears> don't <throat> know who's speaking because you can't see who's speaking. I don't know what's being preserved. Um, if it's going to be these YouTube video live streams, if nothing is being preserved because this is already being made available to the public and it's potentially posted on YouTube forever. Um, so I think that if that is something that you want guidance on, um, maybe that would be a tougher question, or maybe it's something that Lori should reach out to Peggy on to see what, if anything, other committees are doing. I know that from the committees that I have participated in Zoom meetings, um, people were not identifying themselves um, each time they spoke. Um, and then for purposes of the capabilities of Zoom, it does put a box around the yep. little square of the person that's speaking. So it, it is being identified. I don't think that was very helpful, except to say that I think this is something that all of the committees are dealing with and there, there might be a best practice guidance that's being conveyed if you ask for it. Yep, okay. So Lori, would, would you talk to um, Peggy sure. about that? And I think ironically, we might be better off with this system than when we're in person because of the boxes, the pictures, and then- I think the only thing would be if somebody is just um, listening and they don't have the ability to see the faces and the, and the writing. Right, but that's not any committee members now. So any- Well, it could be if people can't see the screen. Right, but if they would like, but, but if our record has it and they wanna check the record, I mean, that's the purpose of the record for somebody to to see what someone said. Right. Uh, I'm just saying there could be someone who can't see. But they'll be able to get the record later. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Yeah, they, can't, they can't get it simultaneously. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, Costa, yeah, tell us what you know about what's happening, what we're likely to see on the uh, stimulus legislation federal that will... Um, that will have infrastructure money. Yeah, so Mr. Chair, at this point, we do not have a lot of details on what the infrastructure stimulus will contain. Uh, we've been talking with our uh, congressional delegation offices and they're set to begin working um, on a bill in the next couple of weeks. And it, it, it seems as though the general direction uh, of the bill will focus on infrastructure in a broad-based sense, um, of which transportation would be one component of it. Uh, again, there's a lot in the air right now, but the idea behind the infrastructure stimulus is really on recovery of the economy. The, the anticipation is that there's going to be significant unemployment over the next few months. And um, as we transition you know, out of the, the virus stage and into the recovery stage that these infrastructure investments are gonna have the effect, uh, a similar effect that they did 10 years ago during the last major stimulus in encouraging employment growth. So although we don't know for sure, to us that indicates that the focus is going to be on uh, rapid construction of projects, um, you know, shorter term than the typical project development cycle to get those dollars out there quickly uh, and get people to work. 
Okay. No, that sounds good. That, that makes sense. Uh, questions for Costa about that coming legislation? Okay, Connie, did I see your hand up? No, you were just suggesting something. Okay. Um, all right. So let's go back to S three thirty nine. Um, thank you very much. That was that was really great. I hadn't been thinking about transportation and the um, uh, and and all these this all this federal legislation uh, until just yesterday. So um, uh, why don't we go back to the walkthrough? And, and Neil and Costa and Michelle, feel free to participate with any questions or comments um, or things you want to stress as, as we go through this, okay? I take it it's okay? Okay. 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 Got yeah. it. Thank you. Section, section nine. Okay. I'll put the uh, share back on. Okay, so we left off at section nine. This deals with suspensions. And for the most part, you're gonna be seeing uh, some of that standard cleanup that we have been doing. The first substantive change is going to be on page 17. And you'll see this change on page 17, starting at line four and having that one of the instances where a commissioner may suspend a license is if an operator is found incompetent to stand trial under 13 BSA section 4817. And then you'll see down on line 11 on that same page that a license suspended pursuant to subdivision C3, the new language that's being added about the license being suspended if the operator is found incompetent to stand trial, that that suspension shall extend until the operator is found competent to stand trial or the criminal case is dismissed. So that will be a substantive change to existing law. A second substantive change to existing law is to give the commissioner the ability to suspend the license of an individual after having a hearing if that license has been suspended or revoked in another jurisdiction. And you'll see that we are not withstanding language here. That language in subsection D, and I'm not sure if it's um, included for purposes of the cleanup. I do not think it is. I can pull that up if, the, oh, here it is. Um, it's saying that the commissioner shall not suspend the license of an operator unless they have been um, uh, convicted of what they are being prosecuted for. But in some instances, other jurisdictions might suspend an individual's license for something other than a conviction. Um, there's sort of a, a range for which other states suspend licenses for. And this gives the commissioner the um, discretion to do that. You'll see on line 17 that it is a May, it's permissive, and there needs to be um, a hearing with 15 days notice before um, that suspension can take place. Um, this section is standalone, so I will pause here. I will stop the share so you can see if there are any questions. Okay. Questions? I, I just have one, Anthea. Um, again, does this change, how, how does this change uh, existing, existing law for these um, circumstances? It changes existing law in two ways. The first is that there will now be the ability for licenses to be suspended pending trial if someone has been found incompetent to stand trial under 13 BSA section 4817. That's the language here that's being added at lines four and five. And then down at lines 11 to 13, is where you're getting the length of that suspension. And I can pull up 13 VSA section 4817 if you wanna see the process that is in place if someone's um, going to be found incompetent to stand trial. And the other way that you're changing existing law is you're giving the commissioner the ability, permissive, may suspend a license after a hearing if the license has been suspended in another jurisdiction. So if someone has been convicted of something that led to a suspension in another jurisdiction, that would be possible under existing law for their license to be suspended here. But if there is that their license has been suspended for something unrelated to a conviction, 
this would allow their license to be suspended here as well. So those are the two changes to substantive law. Okay, so right now, such a person who's declared incompetent um, and has committed a crime or allegedly committed a crime, they, um, we don't speak about their driver's license right now, present law. They, they, they get to keep it, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and now they would possibly not be able to. Okay. Correct. And it is possible that their license would be suspended pending trial for um, a different instance if the commissioner finds, and I'm now looking to current law, this is on page 17 at line one, if the commissioner finds that such operator is seeking to delay the prosecution, then that is an instance that could lead to the suspension of a license. But this is um, sort of saying, if they have been found incompetent to stand trial, the trial can't proceed to get to the point of a conviction where their license would be suspended, their license should be suspended until we get to that point or the case is dismissed. And if the case is dismissed, then the um, suspension would be lifted as well under new language in subsection G. Okay. This might be a more of a, really a, a drafting question, but uh, just because of you know, my, my general dislike for notwithstanding existing law. Um, we're doing that an awful lot in this, in this bill. And, and I know we do a lot in other bills and not just in our committee. However, I'm wondering why not make that change in that other law? So that other law says blah, 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 except for, and then refer the person back up to this section of law for that exception to that law that's, I'm thinking, well, why not deal with, with that that way instead of simply notwithstanding the section? You follow what I'm saying? I am following what you're saying. Um, I think maybe you're um, commingling a lot, and I, I would need to go through this bill to see the instances where we're notwithstanding. But to the best of my knowledge, the only um, instances of notwithstanding that I've walked through today prior to this section was in the COVID-19 language where you're not withstanding something for the pendency of a um, state of emergency. And you're also not changing codified law there. You're saying, ignore the law. We're giving you permission to do that so that you can do this other thing temporarily. Yeah, and we should specify how much time too, but in this is not temporary, for instance. But. Right, this is not temporary. Um, certainly could draft something up in subsection D that included this as well. What it might do is end up, let me pull up D. Um, it might end up making subsection D um, rather clunky and long. If the committee is interested in seeing what subsection D would look like if the subsection H language was ruled into subsection D as opposed to using a notwithstanding clause, then I, I could certainly get that drafted up for the committee to, to look at. And I can go through the balance of S339 to see what instances where there will be new notwithstanding language, if that's something that the committee is interested in seeing. Okay. I'll look into it myself also. Um, um, later. <laughs> okay, other questions on this section for Anthea? No. Okay, thank you. Um, the next section? Okay, so section 10, new language, and I'm putting new in quotation marks, new language is being added to um, language in Title IV that gives the uh, Judicial Bureau hearing officer in the instance of someone whose license is being suspended because of traffic violation to waive, and this is on lines 12 and 13, to waive the reinstatement fee required pursuant to 23 VSA section 675A. I'm putting in new in quotation marks because this ability for a Judicial Bureau hearing officer to waive the reinstatement fee, which is $80 under current law, um, used to be in Title 23, along with all of the other language about suspending um, licenses for non-payment of tickets. 
In 2016, that language was moved over to Title IV, which has the process and procedures for the Judicial Bureau. It is the Department of Motor Vehicles belief that this um, waiver authority was inadvertently um, taken out when that language was moved from Title 23 to Title IV. Um, and this would be sort of putting things back to the way that um, these waiver of reinstatement fees were processed in 2016 and earlier. And if you're looking for the instances in which the reinstatement fee could be waived, it is based on, and this is existing law, linking it to a reduction in the fee at lines 14 down, saying that it would be on the basis of the defendant's driving history, ability to pay, or service to the community. Oh, the collateral consequences of the violation of the interests of justice are the, the remaining balance for when uh, there can be a waiver of the reinstatement fee if you include this language. Again, this is a standalone section, so I'll stop the share so you can see if there are questions. Yeah, Mary, did I see? Um, maybe, maybe. I guess Mary just turned it. Okay. It, it looks like there's actually no no change in that. It's just logistical, moving things around. No, this is a change. Um, the change is, I'll put the share back, saying instead of the hearing officer being able to just reduce the amount due, they can reduce the amount due and waive the reinstatement fee. So okay. currently they cannot waive that $80 reinstatement fee, even though they could reduce the amount due. Okay. Questions about that? Okay. Okay. Next section is section 11. Under current law, um, and we've got a little bit of cleanup with individual. Under current law, and I'm scrolling down to the substantive language, which is on uh, page 20, starting at line 13 and going into line 14. Um, for purposes of when school buses need to be inspected, they need to be inspected three times during the year during three different periods. Under the law as it exists now, the periods are July to August, November to December, and February to March. You'll note that, that while it spans over the course of the entire year, there are periods between say August and November and December and February and March and July when you would not be able to get your school bus inspected and meet the requirements of this law. This is spreading out those three periods, still requiring the school buses be inspected three times a year, but expanding the windows of inspection so they run January to April, May to August, and September to December without those gaps in there. Yep. I'm gonna pause because the next school bus section is, is not is related, but is not the, the same issue. So I'm gonna put you back to your gallery mode. Okay, questions? No, <laughs> okay. Okay, section 12, still dealing with school buses. We are now dealing with the paint color of school buses. So currently um, it says that school buses need to be painted national school bus glossy yellow and that the hood shall be um, particular colors. So this is making it so that uh, the hood is, we're specifying that that color, so there's clarity in drafting, is National School Bus Glossy Yellow. So you'll see a lot of that colors are deleted for National School Bus Glossy Yellow. And then the substantive changes with respect to school buses is that the roof can be either National School Bus Glossy Yellow or white. Currently, it can only be uh, National School Bus Glossy Yellow for the roof of the vehicle. And then the other change is saying that if a school bus is a plug-in electric vehicle, that the bumper will be blue. And my understanding is that this is a change that's being made in the industry so that um, first responders and uh, fire vehicles will know if they're approaching a electric school bus that, um, so there's the des distinction of it having a different uh, blue color. And as you heard Commissioner Minoli say, in terms of what is a must pass section from the department's perspective, 
this is one of those must pass sections because my understanding is that some school buses have already been ordered and would have those blue bumpers, which under current law would not be allowed because there needs to be um, a bumper that's glossy black or um, covered in reflective material are the only two options under the law as it is presently. Okay, is that ever? Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, he sounds great. Do uh, not apologize. Yeah, really. Um, uh, uh, should we take questions now uh, on that one, Anthea, or? Is... Yes. Yeah, okay. Questions on the school bus colors. Okay. Oh, um, Molly? No. Uh, okay, I, I have one. Um, it, it seems to me that this kind of thing shouldn't be in the statute. We should just follow some um, uh, national standards, some national code. Uh, anyone know why we don't do that? Well, we have to actually specify colors. Uh, you certainly do not need to specify colors. Um, the reason why the change is being done in codified law is because currently you're specifying what the school bus colors need to be in law. You could repeal the language about what color school buses need. You could delegate rulemaking authority to the uh, Department of Motor Vehicles to have rulemaking maybe as part of the inspection manual on school buses. Um, it certainly does not need to be in, in codified law. Um, if you are going to reference to some sort of standards, I think that that is something that someone from the Department of Motor Vehicles would be able to provide what those standards should be and what is the industry norm. Um, I did not look into what other states um, have in their codified law with respect to school buses. I certainly can do that, but since this was a proposal that came from the Department of Motor Vehicles to just make these small changes to existing law, that's how I drafted it. Yep. Okay. All right, and I guess the electric um, buses, um, identifying those uh, is because of the safety, because when you approach that, if, the, if it's silent and it's still, if it was a gas or a diesel, you would know where the fuel was. Here, you need to know that there's a, a live battery on board somewhere, right? With I'm high. not the person with that technical expertise, but my understanding is that the different, differenti differentiation for the bumper is for safety notification purposes, not why it needs to be there, but that it is to notify them that it's a different type of vehicle. Okay. Anthea, would this be a good time to take a little break?